And greetings everybody. Welcome back to the channel. Formithrax here and today we're going to be checking out Terminus Zombie Survivors again. <laughs> so we have uh, played Terminus previously. It's been about six months I believe since we last checked in on the game. Um, if you're not aware of what it is, it's uh, by Long Play Studios created by a single developer and um, it's kind of a board gamey light take on Cataclysm Dark Days Ahead. So it's more of a contained and condensed experience where you're journeying through a city trying to escape the uh, the zombie uh, apocalypse and get to a safe spot. Um, I did quite enjoy the gameplay and uh, what, uh, what the game offers and how it offers it uh, when we last checked it out. So we'd played it uh, a fair amount. We had completed it, I think, four times and um, unlocked all the characters that are possible to start with, got a little bit of meta progression from our profile of level ups. Um, at the time that we last played it, I believe there were only two victory paths. One was reaching uh, aforementioned Terminus, which is a, a train station kind of safe point. Um, so that was the primary and original way to quote unquote win. And then there was a second way that involved uh, clearing a dock of a horde of zombies and getting on a boat and uh, equipping the boat and then sailing off. Um, we never did that one. I only saw the docks, I think, one single time in all the runs that we did. Um, so we didn't experience that one, but we did reach Terminus, I think, four times. At the point we stopped playing, we were... Or I was at the point where I was basically cranking the difficulty up to the highest possible difficulty, highest, hardest possible scenario, and so on. Um, I don't think we ever won on that setting, but we got a good feel for kind of how it plays out. Um, and that's kind of where we left it off. So in the intervening time, there have been a lot of updates, some pretty major ones. There's now, I believe, six different victory uh, paths that you can take, and I don't have a lot of details on the other four. Uh, we'll just kind of jump into the game, experience the gameplay again. I'll do some relearning of things. I should be able to very quickly or pretty quickly uh, recover my, my lost knowledge and explain kind of how things work. I'm sure there'll be efficiencies and tips and tricks that I'll have forgotten that uh, hopefully come back to me. Um, but yeah, so it is very, very much, though, in the vein of Cataclysm Dark Days Ahead. Just you're, you're going to recognize a lot of stuff from CDDA and possibly some from uh, Project Zomboid. Um, but it kind of fits in the, in the gap between those. Um, but it is, like I said, very board gamey feeling to me, at least in the way it's presented and the way the systems work. So, um, let's jump in Terminus zombie survivors. Uh, so we're going to do a new game. I, I got a test game in progress. I did uh, earlier today just so I could relearn the controls, but, uh, we'll just write over top of that and we'll start fresh. Uh, of note, we do have a profile up here. And this is kind of one of the meta unlocks as you go through adventures, you gain XP, you level up your profile, and it does unlock uh, access to perks in the game that you can choose to start with. So there is a small amount of rogue light element to it. Um, so you can see which ones we've gotten, which ones we haven't. So completionists and achievement hunters, you know, go crazy. I don't usually pay much attention to this kind of stuff myself, but I know a lot of people like this kind of stuff. Um, so let's hit new game and we'll start talking about how things work. All right. Character selection screen. So when you first start a game or the game, you're only going to have access to this top row. These first three character types, the soldier, the firefighter and the police officer, all the other ones below that will be locked. And as you level up your profile or no, as you complete a run, you unlock a row. So we've completed four runs. That's why these are in gold, because I've achieved victory in these four. And each time we did, it unlocked one of these rows. So we fully unlocked the entire selection tree for different character types. Um, now, these character types, I will mention, are not necessarily in difficulty order or power order, meaning the later ones you unlock aren't more powerful than the earlier ones. They're designed to give a different gameplay experience, not a power progression. So a lot of games, you unlock the later stuff that's more powerful or better. That's not the case in this one. This just changes up kind of the rules and how they're built and what they can do just to provide a different gameplay experience. So it's variety as opposed to power creep. Um, so we got a lot of choices here. Soldier, firefighter, police officer, athlete, security guard, student, park ranger, construction worker, martial artist, chef, farmer, doctor, engineer, driver, and pastor. 
And as you see, each one has a bunch of different abilities, traits, starting points, and so on. So we're gonna further tailor beyond this with some other choices once we make a selection. So if we pick the soldier, for example, uh, a zombie slasher optimized for killing zombies with high combat stats, starting with a fighting knife. They have a unique perk that's unique to their class only, which is the combat instinct perk. Gives them 50% melee attack damage that at level one that you'll start with. And then through play and through experience in game, you'll have the opportunity to upgrade that to a level two version and a level three version. And the same is true for all the characters. They all have a unique perk and you can level them up. And then it shows what stats they begin the game with. Strength three, health three, observation zero, combat five, agility zero, dexterity zero, and then three free points you can spend wherever you'd like. So that's kind of how this is going to work. You can pick a character class, read through its information. A um, lot of details here. I don't think I'm going to try to explain the entire game and all the intricacies of the systems initially. I'll kind of talk about things as we go. But just realize that all of these stats are very important for different reasons, just like any game of this type. Um, but I don't know that there's any real trash stats. They're definitely, if you're a more combat-focused person, then strength, obviously, and combat. Um, but I think from my previous play and reminder, my remembrances, that they're all fairly important. And it, it, the nice thing is if you hover over them, they'll tell you the details. So when your strength is high, you can easily carry more things. For every seven units of inventory weight move, action points is increased by 10%. So basically, it's like Pack Mule. You can carry more stuff with higher strength without limiting or slowing down your movement. Um, the way movement is slowed down is that once you pass a certain amount of weight, it increases the cost to move a space. The action point cost to move goes up. So as you start accumulating more and more, you essentially get slower and slower because you have to pay more to move a space. Uh, then there's health, which is when your health is high, you can do a lot more actions with each turn. Recovers 11.5 action points per turn. So the health stat basically lets you recover um, action points faster. Uh, which means you can do more things faster. Uh, observation, when your observation is high, you can see further. Very important, Very uh, probably one of the most underrated of the stats. Being able to see further is really powerful. <laughs> it's really powerful. Can't overstate that. And you'll see why when we get into the gameplay. Uh, combat, fairly straightforward. You can attack zombies more effectively. And at our current value of five points committed, we do 200% weapon damage. Agility. When your agility is high, you can move faster and better avoid attacks. The move action point decreases by 0% because we have no points spent. And there is a 0% chance to avoid attacks. So should we put points into this category, we would get a decrease in the cost it takes us to move, uh, which essentially speeds us up. And there is a 0% chance to avoid attacks. So again, if we put points in, we would have a dodge ability, basically. Zombie attacks us, we would roll dice. And if we rolled lower than our dodge value, we would just avoid or ignore the attack. Very powerful. And then finally, dexterity. This is another one that I think a lot of people might ignore, but you want to be very careful with that assumption. Uh, when your dexterity is high, crafting speed and the results durability are increased. So... The crafting speed, while it is consequential and can be important, it's not as much so as the durability increase, especially for very particular items. I remember coming into this realization late in my previous gameplay, the power of that durability increase. Basically, with no points in it, anything I craft is going to be a shoddy piece of junk. It's going to have very low durability. It's going to break constantly and not have a lot of usability. So I'll have to make a new one to replace the previous one all, all constantly. So by having a lot of dexterity, when you're building weapons, there'll be much higher durability and last a lot longer, which is really powerful because sometimes depending on your settings and your situation, it can be really hard to find weaponry and having const the ones you do find constantly break uh, can be very dangerous. Um, but there's also certain tools and repair items that having high durability on them lets you use them a lot more and can be really powerful as well. So don't underestimate it. Uh, make sure you, you give it a try or test it out. Um, but there we go. So that's kind of how things work. You got these basic stats. The character classes have locked in certain ratings that you cannot change. And then the three white boxes are the three points that I get to put wherever I want, basically. So we have available points and we have locked in points for that particular character class. And each class has its own special unique perk. Um, so we've got to decide what we're going to play. Uh, I might just play soldier to start. I mean, it's fairly straightforward combat bonuses. 
Um, I, in my opinion, the actual strongest character on this entire list that I, I came to the realization of after playing it previously is this guy, Security Guard. Stupid, stupid, powerful, unique action. Just amazingly powerful, unique action. And all it is is listen. Temporarily listen to all the sounds of the current place. What that means is for one action point, you basically get to pulse out a sonar blast and locate every enemy on the map that you're currently on. <laughs> that is so powerful being able to do that. Uh, by far, that's the most important, most powerful, unique action. So if you want an easy mode character, take the security guard over the, the so soldier and so on. Knowing where all the enemies are, exactly where they are at all times is just such a crazy powerful ability in this kind of a game. So <laughs> that's my recommendation. You want easy mode? Go for security guard. After that, you know, a lot of, a lot of choices. Um, it, it feels like the powerful characters are actually the ones on the top. And the ones below are kind of like for flavor variety. And they actually seem to get weaker. They provide more of a challenge the further down this list you go. Uh, I mean, pastor, driver, engineer, and so on. These are all fairly lightweight compared to the combat-focused or really super ability-focused ones up top. Okay, so what are we going to play? I, I want to pick somebody I haven't actually completed yet. So let's just do the simple one. Let's go ahead and stick with Soldier. Uh, let's pull the three points out. So... I probably need to keep the observation. I I would love to go agility or dex. Yeah, let's go. Let's go dex. Let's go. I, I talked up dex. Let's go ahead and take a point of dex. <clears throat> so we'll have a tiny bit of uh, durability. So we're going to go from poor quality dur or poor durability items when we craft them to very low durability items. Woohoo! Now there will be opportunities to raise these during gameplay, um, but not a lot from from what I remember. All right, so we are Vormithrax, we're a soldier, uh, we have our stats locked in, uh, we can go select some traits, actually we have zero traits available because we start with parkour. Do I want to start with parkour? Uh, so parkour specifically, as the pop-up indicates, halves the AP cost and avoids sprains when passing through windows or over fences. So for climbing through a window or going over a fence, it's more expensive to move through normally and it rolls random dice, and we might get a sprain when we attempt to do it. So with the parkour, we totally avoid the sprain possibility, and it also makes it faster for us to do these actions. So it's a pretty pretty expensive trait. Uh, so here's the list, and again, this list is very short when you first start to play, typically. I think only these first three are available. And then your meta progression from your profile, as you do adventures, you'll level up your profile, um, that unlocks more and more of these as choices you can pick from the start. So you can see there's still stuff I have not gotten enough points via my profile unlocks to start with. And some of these are really powerful. But um, we made it down to, to here, to parkour, so that's why I had that one selected. Um, let's go with maybe infection resistance. I think there's, isn't there a, is that the, is that the cure disease one? Maybe that is the diseased one. Oh, maybe it's beastly resilience. Yeah, beastly resilience. Recover from status ailments, bleeding, etc. twice as fast when sleeping. Let's take that one. That one's important for a couple of reasons. That leaves us two points. Uh, let's do... Each time you burn an unread book or a thick book, your morale increases. That's funny. Uh, not music lover. I guess we'll go with good stomach. So this kind of list is pretty familiar for folks that, uh, you know, play Cataclysm and a few other games, um, having a perk list that you can choose from with different abilities. That's where a lot of this comes from. All right, we're going to confirm that. So we have Beastly Resilience and Good Stomach perks or traits, and we are all set. Let's go ahead and, oh yeah, there's one other thing, gameplay settings here. So gameplay settings is where you can basically set difficulty and scenario options. So let's go ahead and click on that. And you can see difficulty levels here. Easy, normal, hard, and apocalypse with permadeath on or off. Uh, enables permanent death. Option enable your score will be increased. Allows continuation from the most recent save. Nah, we don't play with saves. We always play permadeath. So permadeath on. <laughs> Just no, no, no save reloading. Give me increased points. Uh, so this is the standard difficulty level if you stay on the usual scenario, but you have a choice for difficulty and then scenario, and then you can actually go into a sandbox settings option. 
So for this first one, while I'm relearning, we'll just do normal. Um, we did, we were playing Apocalypse last time when we left off. And then there's a particular scenario. Uh, I think Crowd was the, the hardest one, short of Frozen Zombies, the, the wintertime version. Um, there are seasonal changes in the game if you stay in the game world long enough where temperature is, we're heading into winter from where we start. So temperature will become more and more of a problem as time passes. Uh, out of stock, basically 90% of the furniture in special places, except for houses is empty. Most doors and windows have been broken. Items and found in houses has been increased by 10%. And then crowd dangerous places have tripled. I'll explain dangerous places when you can see the map, uh, but it's basically the point at which enemies spawn and then move outward into the cities. Uh, so yeah, we were doing apocalypse with crowd and just all sorts of stuff, but let's leave it on sanctuary, the default for now. And then sandbox settings, you know, you can turn this on and then you've got freedom to fiddle as you would like. Lots of sliders. If you want more of something, less of something. Here you go. I do love me some player agency in setting up a game world in the way that they want. Uh, but we're going to stay on bog standard. So there you go. Uh, that is the gameplay settings. Make sure you take advantage of it. Uh, let's hit start. Alright, game objective. Infected zombies are attacking people. Your house is still safe, but electricity and water have been cut off and there are few supplies left. In your last communication, you've learned that the surviving people have gathered in Terminus. Arrive at the Terminus safely to survive. Tip, you can get a radio and listen to the broadcast or follow the railroad tracks to find out where the Terminus is located. Okay, so it is not a pretty game. Let's get that right out of the way. It's, it's, it's functional. We'll call it functional. Um, yeah, it's functional. So here is the map and the map is this set of, of tiles right here. We have, what is this? 10 by 10, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, apparently one, two, three, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. Yeah. It's 11 by 11 grid of squares. We are in a house, and then there's going to be some yard out this direction. But every single map space is, is 11 by 11, with usually a building or some kind of structure in the middle and stuff. Um, here is the map. So we start down here. We always start in the south. Terminus is always somewhere along this top edge of the map. It's randomly positioned each time. The map is always randomized. It uses kind of a grid point with uh, lines drawn between the locations and you move from place to place to place along that grid. These dangerous places are where zombies are spawning. We cannot actually move into any of these dangerous places. They're a no-go zone. But from these, it spawns zombies and they move out to the connected locations that are nearby. Um, so you want to try to avoid these unless you're looking for a fight. So it might be nice if we can swing wide west around this little cluster. Usually they're a little more spread out than this, but these are randomized also. And that option in the settings where we could have uh, doubled the number of dangerous places, that's exactly what this does. It basically puts six of these out on the map instead of just three. So you have a huge density of zombies that increases as time goes by. Um, so uh, you'll see a little better how the map works here in a moment when I start unveiling some of the connections between but that's the map, uh, the overworld map. This is our uh, tactical map of the location we're in. So when you first start, your house is always completely free of zombies. The house itself and this whole 11 by 11 map grid, this section has no zombies in it. You're perfectly safe here initially. Zombies can move into it eventually, but it would take a little while. Now, this is very much a board gamified version of Cataclysm gameplay. Uh, with the assumption that you're doing uh, an in-city type of adventure in Cataclysm, where you're going to be moving from house to house and looking for various commercial and industrial buildings, fire stations and pharmacies and libraries and so on. Um, we're going to be trying to gather up resources, weapons and clothing and food and so on. 
We're very much under time pressure because the zombie spawning locations, the dangerous locations, are going to continuously put out zombies. It's going to get worse and worse. So we need to get to our safe point, Terminus. Now, as I mentioned, there are apparently five other uh, victory condition paths. I only know of the two that were in the game six months ago, which is reach Terminus at the north end of the map and find the docks location clear the docks, repair and supply the boat, and then apparently you could sail off in the boat. I never did that one, so I don't know much more beyond that general description. But there's four new ones that have been added that I know nothing about. Uh, the game has had upgrades in a lot of different areas, so we'll see how many of those we can discover. Uh, I don't remember the list. Um, basic interface-wise, though, we have our map, the help screen, which is actually very helpful. You've got the introduction, you got basic controls information, then with all the details on, you know, everything. Um, zombie information, places information. So, it's a, a very good repository of the information you're going to need. It's not terrible hard to pick up, the, uh, the basics. Um, and it's been a while since I read through that, but I remember it being fairly useful. All right, then we've got up top, information, daytime. It's day one, daytime, 6 o'clock. Sun sets at 20 o'clock, 8 o'clock. So we've got 14 hours until sunset. When sunset occurs, visibility is going to be cut down to near zero. Um, temperature gets colder, and zombies become more active and aggressive. Uh, we are in a house, and the weather, as you can see, is 50 degrees and clear. Um, these all mean something, so the temperature is going to be effective uh, or affect us in various ways. Uh, we're going to need clothing and, and so on. Uh, we have an info panel down here, currently under the condition. These are number keys, one, two, three, four, five on your keyboard. Um, you can see our character info, our inventory, kind of a quick synopsis. We're at 0 0.3 carry weight, our total weight currently. And our movement action points per distance or per tile moved is one. As this number increases, it'll get slower and slower for us to, or more expensive for us to move. Uh, we currently have no conditions, no effects. And then we've got these little stats here. These are secondary stats. <clears throat> so hit points uh, reflects your health status. If it drops to zero, you die. It is restored when satiety or hydration is high and decreases when low. So hit points is affected by satiety and hydration. You want to keep these good. This satiety is food, if you're not familiar with that word. Um, so you want to keep yourself full and keep yourself watered. And these two being high will help your hit point regeneration. AP is action points. This is how you do things. If you want to move, it costs action points. You want to fight, costs action points. Craft, action points. Read, action points. Everything costs action points, any action that you take. The more you have, the more you can get done in a quote-unquote turn. Um, and you want to have them regenerate as quickly as possible. So right now, or the, the other thing is, so hit points is satiety and hydration. Action points is affected by energy and morale. So if we keep energy and morale high, we'll have a better regeneration of our action points. So when all of this stuff starts getting low, things get grim. Because we're not going to get as much hit point regen. We're not going to get as much action point regen. That's how these all work. So hit points are satiety, hydration, action points, energy, morale. Uh, I'm not going to show all the details on these for the moment. The arrows indicate what direction they're currently trending based on current conditions. So it's a quick way of just noting. All right, details. This is our movement, how much it's costing us to move. Uh, defense, encumbrance, water, fire, resist. Yes, you need to, you need to resist water. <laughs> if it's raining and you get wet, you have negative things that happen. And it's also also bad to be on fire of course uh, our visibility is 4.2 squares or 0 0.5 at night so literally that's one two three four squares that's why we can see out to this position through this window uh, we can't see the fifth one because we don't have enough vision and that's what i mentioned the observation skill is super important being able to see an enemy before they can see you because you have better vision very powerful um, and then our attack power, our base attack power is 200% because of our five combat skill. And there's actually more on the list. We have a scroll bar here. We have no dodge rate because we have agility zero. Our reading speed is the default five pages per action point spent. Drafting speed of two based on our decks. No alcohol and no medicine in our system currently. Uh, experience. We're going to gain experience. Interestingly, in this game, you gain experience based on the action points you have used. And I think it uses action points secondarily, 
even if you have some left over and you end your turn, they get used for some function. I forget exactly how it pays you off for those points, but uh, basically you want to be using action points constantly. The more you have, the faster you're going to level, the faster you can regen the points, the faster you're going to level, because it's all based on how many action points you've used. All AP is convert. All used AP is converted to experience. When you gain a certain amount, you can acquire survival skills. So as soon as we fill this bar and we go up a level, we'll get to pick a new survival skill. It might be to upgrade this to the next level. It might be a completely new one. We're going to be given a choice. Um, stats. These are the stats we chose originally, and they all max out at five. We may have an opportunity to increase these as we ad adventure. And finally, any traits that we have. These are the traits we started with. So beastly resilience, which lets us recover from status ailments faster uh, when sleeping, and a good stomach. Morale no longer decreases when eating. Um, so and then we have buttons over here for moving, crafting, and so on. Uh, space bar will end the turn. Let's go ahead and start doing things. So our character, the bars are hit points and action points. Red for hit points, white for action points. Um, if I put my cursor over a position... It'll show you in the pop-up for where the cursor's at. It says inside the building. If I right-click, it'll move. It'll cost me 1.8 action points to get to that location because I'm saving 10%. If I go here, it costs me one. So normally you would think, all right, one to there is going to cost two to there. Well, no, because you get a 10% savings. So it's going to cost less to move further. And that's kind of an important thing to realize. Longer action, longer distances give you a savings in your total action points spent, but they tend to be more dangerous because you're moving to a further position where you may not be able to see all around the end point. And you might encounter zombies or enemies at that end point that you weren't aware of previously. And you'll see how that works here in a bit. But you want to generally, to save action points, you want to move as far as possible and get that savings maxed out. Um, so you got to kind of plan your movement around that. So let's go over here first and we'll investigate this dresser that says unchecked. So we'll just say move to there. That used up 2.1 of my action points, so the white bar is decreasing. We're going to search the box or the chest here, search the furniture, and it's going to cost us action points. Everything costs action points. So two to search. We found a soft drink and a rat trap. I don't care about the rat trap, but we'll go ahead and take the soft drink. Um, now, windows are good and bad. We can move through a window if we open it. It'll cost us points to open it. And then we have that possible problem where we did not take parkour where we could theoretically sprain our ankle it doesn't happen super often i don't remember having to deal with that too often but it does happen you can also board up windows you can put curtains over windows to block line of sight a lot of things you can do there um we're going to move to the far corner of the room there <clears throat> open the door and go through all right we got a lot of stuff to search in here I probably should have moved to that position to save me the movement points, but oh well. It's going to take me a while to get back into the uh, the mode of remembering how to do everything optimally. Ammunition! Sure, we'll take some ammo. We got no weapon yet. Oh, we got a pillow. Pillow can be used while sleeping. Using it gives the following effect. Sleep quality plus 35%. So what that means is... There are multiple ways to increase the sleep quality, and essentially what it does is it shortens the amount of sleep that you have to perform to get the effects of the full rest period. So the less you have to sleep, that means you have more time to do other things. So it is important if you have the opportunity to use a pillow, use a blanket, sleep on a bed or a couch that'll give you a sleep quality bonus, stack up the sleep quality bonuses. Then instead of needing to sleep eight hours to fully recover your energy and your hit points, it might only take four hours and then you can get about doing other things. Um, so pretty important. We'll take it antidepressant and gloves another important one with one specific use i mean it gives you a temperature bonus if you wear them but in particular they're used to search rotting corpses on the ground and the gloves get used up basically when you do so but it prevents you from getting diseased while searching rotten corpses so having a few pairs of gloves handy is a good thing all right what are we down to our our, our bar is pretty low we're at 4.6 should have just enough to get over here. Oh, we got a street map. That's very powerful. And then we also got a cat's eye book. Teaches the survival skill, which increases nighttime visibility. 
Um, so when I look at this book, few things to note. I should explain this. So the book main pop-up section says, when you finish it, you acquire the following survival skill, cat's eye. There are 313 pages to the book. My reading speed is five pages per action point, um, meaning I'd have to do, I'm getting a little more than 10 action points per, per turn because of our regen. This means it's going to take quite a few turns. I mean, 10 turns would give us our 10 action points, which is my regen ability per turn would give us 50 pages. So basically six plus seven turns or so in order to read the full book of me just sitting here and reading, passing, reading, ending turn, reading, ending turn, reading, ending turn. And then I would get that ability and the ability itself is listed to the right. Nighttime visibility goes up. So it would double our visibility range, which should be helpful. Now, the other thing to note is where it has the pop out to the right that says cat's eye nighttime visibility. Note the very bottom line in gray it says acquired zero out of four. You can actually read this. Well, you can get four of these books, read them and get this thing four times, getting you a total of 2.0 nighttime visibility bonus. Um, a certain trait, I think the student starts with, I forget who, well, one of the traits uh, lets you reread a book over and over again. So you don't need multiple copies, basically. Um, otherwise, most books are read once and they're gone um, and you have to go get another copy. Uh, so we'll definitely take that. We'll have some downtime where we can work on that. All right, we've got enough to move and then we're out. We have 0 0.6 action points. We can't really do anything. So I'm just gonna hit space to end the turn. Now, when I end my turn, you'll note right here, player turn, then it's other survivor's turn, and then the zombies get their turn. There's no zombies in this first one, so you won't see much happening. Um, but just realize when you hit end turn, everything else in the world basically gets to move. Hey there, Apocalypse Andy. Thank you very much for some uh, some gift sub droppery. Appreciate that. Yeah, that's the uh, Fahrenheit Celsius. Or no, that's the button that uh, does the overlay for temperature. You can change the uh, the Fahrenheit Celsius options in, I think, the settings somewhere. I forget where. I'm American, so we're using the Fahrenheit. <clears throat> All right. Uh, yeah. Either murder. Oh, no, you gave. Oh, no, murder didn't get one. Good, good, good. Murder doesn't deserve one. <laughs> Despite his kind words. He is a murderer. <clears throat> is it really murder when they just keep coming back? I still ask that. I mean, it, it, it can't really be murder. <laughs> they just come right back. He is a temporary inconveniencer of, of Phoenixes. <laughs> All right. Let's do this thing where we keep looking. Oh, we got the good stuff. We got a school bag. Um, I'll talk about that in a second. Let's go ahead and take it and a flashlight and a sweater. So if we open up our inventory, we got category selections up here, or we can select from a drop down to see the category, the weight or the value. I love options where I can pick weight so I can make decisions <laughs> that make sense. So yeah, weight 0 0.7, 0 0.6, 0 0.5. So it lists everything in order of weight. We'll do category for now. All right, let's talk about school bag. So that whole inventory thing, notice we're up to 3.8 now. That number there, 3.8. We're still below what our strength will allow us to carry. So we have our stats, we have strength. For every six units of inventory weight, movement AP is increased by 10%. So we haven't gotten near that yet, so our movement is not yet impaired. Um, but the thing to note is when we highlight this, a simple backpack designed for school use with limited capacity. Capacity is 15, weight reduction of 40%, and its condition and durability are 53% and medium, and it's one encumbrance itself. Now what happens here is when I put this on, and if I right click, I get this option I click on. I'm only allowed to have one back item. This will fill that slot. And if you watch the number here, weight reduction is gonna cause that to go down because of the 40% weight reduction up to a certain amount of capacity. So that has lowered our effective inventory weight, which means we've got even further to go before we're going to go overweight and have to pay extra action points. So there's a number of items like this, and you want to kind of decide which ones to wear or not wear. The little shirt icon indicates that I am currently wearing this item. Um, we'll find more of these types of things, and they fit in different slots, <clears throat> but you'll juggle them 
Sometimes they'll be helpful, sometimes not, depending on your different conditions and statuses. But the other thing I want to mention in that list is durability and condition. So durability is kind of like the quality level. That indicates the overall strength of the item and how resistant it is to being damaged or how many times you might be able to use it before it's going to go away. Um, the condition is the actual hit points. And as it takes damage over time, it's going to lower the condition down to zero eventually and then disappear. Now, the thing to realize about clothing like this is they degrade over time while being used. So if you sometimes wonder, well, what the hell happened to my jacket or my backpack? It probably just degraded over time and disappeared without you noticing. Um, it's not doesn't need to take hits or anything. They just get they, they slowly degrade. So be aware of that. Um, and then the sweater is just going to give us some temperature bonus. It's got a low durability and 49% condition. So ideally, when you're looking at items, it basically, you, you could have two baseball bats, for example, but it randomizes the stats for the condition and durability. So be careful to look at all each copy of an item. They're not identical. So one might be high durability, high condition, and the other one might be low poor durability and 5% condition. You want to make sure you take the good one, not take the other one, even though they look exactly the same graphically. Um, so you'll see, we'll get into that a little bit later too, but we're going to wear that. Uh, we're going to go ahead and wear the sweater because we need, uh, we need some temperature protection. Um, and we're going to go ahead and say, use the pillow, which does not give us any encumbrance. We're just indicating that I do want to use that when I sleep. And then we'll leave the gloves off for the moment. I don't need those. And I don't want them to actually let's leave, uh, let's leave the pillow off for the moment too. I'm not sure if that degrades. It does have a condition rating. I don't know if it degrades when you sleep or if it degrades as long as I have this, I guess I could activate it and then look everybody remember 86.4 <laughs> and tell me to come back and look at it a little bit later. All right. Um, so yeah, that's, that's that system. So for our find, for example, our fighting knife here is durability poor. But condition 100%. As we use it, it's going to go down in condition until eventually it'll break. We do have, through crafting, options to repair things. And we'll, we'll again get into that a little bit later. Uh, let's talk about street map. So street map, it can be used to check information about nearby places. Let's go ahead and right-click on it to use it. Brings up the map. And you can see we have a little, little line with a little bubble at the end showing us how many points it's going to cost to use it. And what this does is... If you move it nearby your current location, like if I put it here, it says use AP4 and available places to check three. As I wave this around, if I move it down slightly, there's only one place to check here. What it's doing is it's finding the nodes that are within that circle, and it's going to reveal what kind of location that is. So you want to carefully kind of scan around your location, and we want to find uh, the spot with as many nodes as possible. Now, the further you get from your current position, the more expensive it gets. So if I try to scan up here, it's going to cost 35 action points. I'll never have that. So keep it uh, pretty tight to your location here. I guess three. I think we had it safe. We had it say four for a second, but I may not find that sweet spot again. We'll just go with three. All right. So read the street map. You can check the location of three places. It's going to cost me four AP. And there we go. So house, 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 which is pretty normal for this location. Uh, let's, I think the four number was the action point cost that I was remembering. So scanning around, we've got, we can fit two in here. Sometimes you can tell where a route has openings where, you're, where you have no connections. So you know there's, there's like gaps in the connections between these nodes. Um, again, it's hard for me to describe. You'll see what I mean later. Let's go ahead and spend our turn. Ooh, a library. Let's go ahead and spend our turn just mapping things in. So it looks like there's a blank spot right in here where there's not going to be a connection this direction, for example. All right, how about this way? One single, one single thing. It's going to be a house. Let's not worry about that one. All right, and I can use this anytime I want for that purpose to kind of scan around me. Just cost action points, which takes time. All right, we're almost out of points again. So these are all done. We need to go check out these other rooms. Uh, let's just go ahead and regen our points. So we need to remember, I started with 20 as my max action points. I can only regen 11.5. So if I hit space bar to end the turn, we get back 11.5. We're up to 13.5 now. Um, but you got to carefully manage this. 
And it's probably the most important thing to learn how to manage effectively, especially once we start getting into contact with the zombies. Search it. All right, so we got some clean water, a fresh smelt, <laughs> an onion, and a carrot. And that is it. Our house is completely searched. So that was the refrigerator. Uh, let's talk about food now that we have it a little bit. So we have clean water, super important. We're always going to be looking for more water. You can right-click and hold to drink until you're completely full, hydrated. Or you can just right-click once to drink a little bit, sip it. Um, food has a duration or a, a spoil timer. Um, non-canned and bottled food and such. So fresh food like this. So that one is going to expire in 31 turns. 241 and 82. Um, now what happens is there's actually several stages. So this is their fresh status. When that timer counts down to zero, they go to stale status. And then a new timer will be generated showing a, a new set of turns. And when that hits zero, they then go rotten. And, you know, that's not good. So you want to try to make sure you use the food, preferably while it's fresh, uh, at least while it's it's stale and then try to get rid of it and use it up before it goes rotten. Um, there's a lot, a lot of crafting recipes. We'll get into that in a second. Uh, for the moment, we're just going to carry this with us and we'll deal with it in a bit. You can see our energy, morale, hydration, and satiety are all dropping slowly over time. So let's get moving. Um, so our starting map is mostly complete. Uh, we know because of our street map that there's going to be a, 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 a position going out this direction. So these little arrows are basically the paths where we can follow those lines to the other locations. So we've visibly seen and or we used our street map to explore these three. And if I move out this window, uh, I think we'll have enough visibility. We should see one right over here because our street map said that there was a connection out that direction. So let's go ahead and go out the door this direction. Yep, there it is right there. So when we open our map, we knew there was something down here from our use of the street map, little circle thingy. Um, but I don't know what kind it is. It's, it's going to be a house, most likely. So there's a lot of these different kinds of nodes. Houses are like the one I was just in. There's various designs of houses, and we're going to find certain types of items there. Library, obviously, is going to have a high chance of finding books. Fire stations are awesome. Fire stations have equipment like fire axes and crowbars. There's a fire truck that may or may not be running. You can get vehicles operational to move around the map a lot faster. And more importantly, moving via a vehicle does not use up your action points, uh, which is really powerful. Um, and lots of others, police stations, and I don't remember the whole list, but uh, actually we can look here. Places, no, oh, fortified houses, churches, clothing stores, electronic stores, grocery, gas, gun, hardware, library, the marina, that's where the boat uh, with the dock, that's one of the escape options. Military base, I think that's new, I don't remember military base. Uh, park, pharmacy, police station, research center, that's new. Restaurant, seaside, railroad tunnel, and terminus itself. So most of them are obvious that are non-houses. I mean, gas station, you can figure what you might find at a gas station, gun shop. There are good reasons for going to these places, but it's all going to depend on the map and where we move. Um, we are under time pressure in that food is scarce. We, you cannot sit still, generally. Um, not initially, at least. Uh, it's very hard to set up a like home camp and stay there because you'll scour out the local resources pretty quickly. So unless you've got gardening skills and a lot of garden of options and some other ways of increasing your food supply over time, it's really rough to stay in one spot. Um, so we need to be a nomad and keep moving and moving and moving, basically, and scour our way to the north. Um, let me just kind of move around and do things. And as we come across a new system, I'll, I'll kind of chime in on stuff. But uh, uh, that's the, the, the... Whoops. Oh, well, I didn't mean to move there, but... Uh, I hit the move button here to get information on the move. Uh, I keep hitting M instead of W to open the map. I kind of want to swing west around these dangerous places, so I don't really want to go this way. I think I'm going to go to this location instead. So we want to go that way. So we're going to set up as long a move as it'll allow me to save points. I only have uh, 1.7 left, so we'll go to... Uh... Uh, let's just go up here. Really? Oh, yeah, that's right. All right, yeah, we're not going to go anywhere. Move. Does it show me? 
So line of sight, it's, it's drawing blue lines. I think this is showing me everything I can see from the position I'll be at. Yeah, so this is showing me what I can see from that position uh, with my, my vision radius. All right, I don't need that right now. Just go there. Our very inefficient start so far. <laughs> what the hell? A zombie wandered in already. Well, look at this. Okay. Wonder which node he came in from. We're only, I don't know how many times, we're, we're at 9 o'clock? Jeez, that was fast for a zombie to show up already. So there's going to be a large number of zombies in the game that are different types. Anybody who's played Cataclysm Dark Days Ahead is going to be right at home because they all mimic the uh, the Cataclysm Dark Days Ahead zombies. Um, you got construction workers, cops, bloateds, culks, fat, or runner zombies, all different types. And they all work in the way that you would kind of expect. Um so what's showing here is when I highlight this, it's showing me the range that he can both see and attack. So where I'm at currently, he can't see me. I'm outside of his, his vision range and his attack range uh, is out to here as well. So if I moved one over, notice the little symbol that appears here. That's warning me that if I move to that position, I'm in attack range of that zombie on his turn. So if I stepped here and ended my turn, the zombie would know I'm here. He'd come at me and he'd be able to attack me. So it's very board gamey in this way. This is why I described this as kind of a board gamey implementation of Cataclysm Light. Um, so with this information, I have enough action points at 9.3. It would cost me 2.5 to get to there. I'd have plenty of points left over to go ahead and attack the zombie. Now, the information showing on the pop-up for this is his hit points for three different body locations. That's head, torso, and legs. It's important distinction because there's reasons why you might go after one part of his body or another. His attack damage that I can expect to receive for each attack he inflicts on me and how many action points he has. And that action points is what gives him the ability to move those three spaces to my location and attack. The runner zombie is the one that I hate the most and probably everybody hates because they have enough movement, enough action points to cover like three quarters of the map really really hard to sneak up on or get away from runner zombies and if you step around a corner with low points left you're basically going to get bit <laughs> you're going to get attacked um so he should be pretty easy for us to kill let's go ahead and go over next to him more zombies what the heck game load me up the good news is we're out of his vision range and his attack range so that's a standard zombie no variant now, the zombie here, I can right-click to attack. And here is the combat system. Fairly straightforward, but it does provide you with enough variability to be interesting in, in different ways. It's going to list what weapon, what melee weapons I have available to me here. It's got the three different hit locations and how many hit points each has currently. And when you highlight it, it tells you head attack. Attack the zombie's head can kill zombies by getting the head hit points to zero. I have not selected a weapon yet, so let's go ahead and pick my knife. And you can see here on the knife, the damage it's going to do per swing. We're getting a bonus for attacking the head. The knife has a head attack bonus. If I go for the legs, I actually get a negative 50% damage to legs. Um, the knife's at 100% condition and such. So you want to be very careful that you check your weaponry and make sure that what you're using matches up to these bonuses. So I would want to go for a head attack in this case. So 50% more condition loss because we're stabbing into a hard skull. So the damage to our knife is going to be greater on condition rating because we're, 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 we're smashing it into a skull. Um, so there's a consequence to going for the headshot and going to try to kill him. Uh, but you can see all the other information. So hit chance is 100%. Damage is going to be 4.1 to 5 after it adds up all of our bonuses. We have a weapon fit for that location bonus, an attack power bonus, and a combat instinct bonus. So all that changes the 1.4 to 1.7 damage number up into 4.1 to 4 or 4.1 to 5. So there's a chance I can kill it in one blow. It's got four and a half head hit points. So we may or may not get a killing blow depending on how it randomizes our roll. And it's going to take one action point to do. Um, alternatively, I could go for the legs. We're going to do 2.7 to 3.3. We wouldn't be able to chop out the legs in one blow likely. We might. 
If we take the legs out, he turns into a crawler zombie. His speed goes way down. And then the body attack. So a normal 100% will easily, we're, we're guaranteed to take out the body. Um, now this won't, from memory, I don't think body attacks will kill the zombie. I forget the actual effect. That actually just flat out kills it when you hit zero. That chops the legs off and they go really slow. I think this removes their torso and they can't attack me with claw attacks anymore. I can't remember. Well, we'll do both. We'll do this first and see what the effect is. Yeah, it took the arms off. Now he can still bite, I think. <laughs> I forget the exact uh, the exact options they're gonna have here. Um, let's cancel out of this for a second. So he's still got his full action points. Yeah, I can't remember what that does. Uh, zombies, conditions, no. So clawing, he won't be able to do. Zombies can try clawing until the survivor bleeds. The more damage a zombie causes, the more likely they are to cause bleeding. Grabbing decreases the survivor's AP. You can try grabbing until the survivor runs out of AP and then biting infects the survivor. Um, if you're bleeding and you run out of AP, they bite you. Okay. I forget what uh, happens on... I know that. This is the same info. Just... Yeah, I can't remember what the um, net effect of this is. Hmm. Well, let's go back in and fight him anyway. So we got lucky and we got a we got a head kill. Look at my condition though. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Just those couple of blows and we went from 100% to 81%. Did it describe it lower down? Uh, limbless, armless, uh, with a body hit point of zero. They can't claw or grab because their arms are cut off. They can still move and will attempt to bite whenever survivors are in a condition in which they can be bitten. So he wouldn't have been able to damage me, basically, without other zombies around to inflict bleeds and lower my and grab me and lower my 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 action points. So, all right. Good to know. The so crawling zombie has leg, leg hit point of zero, completely broken. They drag their bodies, no longer rely on their legs to move, so their actions are based on their body hit points. Attack power is reduced. Yeah, they're really slow, and they can't do a bunch of damage, basically. And then a limbless zombie, you take out the legs and the torso, uh, can no longer move or attack. Even if it's a zombie like this, if it's blocking the path, they can only pass once you've dealt with it. So basically, they become a stump, and you have to get rid of them if you want to move through their position, but otherwise, you can go around them. Um, so, it's very important, though, to, to, you know, you don't necessarily need to kill every zombie. Just do what you need to do to get past them, around them, and so on. Because you're not really getting XP for the kill. You're getting XP just for using action points. Uh, so this guy we can't do much with. We're down to 4.7 action points. I either need to change my path or kill him next round. Now, the thing I gotta worry about, we're under time pressure, we're under food and water pressure and we're under condition of our items pressure if i blow out my combat knife early i won't have it available to use for other purposes and things become difficult let's uh let's try to go around this guy i'd have to go way down here and then come up he's 2.5 1.7 1.9 we wouldn't have a problem killing him let's just wait get most of our action points back and Yeah, the knife is already getting in. All right, let's grab the rag. We need that for various things. I should have grabbed that one while I was over there too. Now I'm gonna move here, but I'm not gonna transition across. Um, we've got 9.8, it's gonna require nine to go through it, but it is a terrible idea to transition to a new map with no action points remaining. This is the danger point. Always, always, always make sure you have a good supply of action points before you move to a new map. Because for all I know, I could transition over and there could be three zombies waiting for me on the other side. Um, and then I would have no points left to do anything. So we're going to wait here a turn, get our full bar, then move. 
We're going to have 11 when we arrive, which should give us plenty of opportunity. And it shouldn't be too dangerous over here yet. All right, so we have an open window we can go through if we want to risk a sprain. Low probability, yep. Uh, it's already 11 o'clock. Let's bring up our map. So we're here now. I want to do, uh, before I move, use our mapping tool. Two, one, one. Not too many choices. Sometimes you want to go this direction, but the game provides you no links to go that direction, and they force you up this way and, and such. It can be really annoying. So that there says two, but I can't seem to catch a two going up this way. Where was that? It flashed to, all right, right there. Another library, and it does have a connection down to this house. All right, so we'll explore this house, and I think I might go here and then up to the library, but I need to find something I can use for a weapon, or I need to cobble a weapon together so I don't keep using my knife for easy fights. So we'll see if we can do some construction here pretty soon too. Um, what do we got left? We got seven. Now I can't see up here. There could be zombies right here. So if I move to this window, I'd be out of points. And if there was a zombie that can see me then, I'd be in big trouble. So this is where you gotta be very careful about your action points expenditure. Um, I'm gonna wait the turn out again. Now every time I wait, an hour goes by and it's gonna be, the sun goes down in nine hours. All right, let's go to this position, and then we'll decide what we're going to do. Looks good. No sprain. More water, another onion, and a fresh apple. Um, I do want this. A lantern. Use it at night. Gives the following effect. Consumes 15% charge. Brightness 4 for one turn. And at 45% charge total, I can use it three times. So basically, brightness 4 just means it'll provide light out to four spaces. And a map of fragments. We're up to 6.1. We are starting to get a little bit of an increase in our action point costs for moving. Uh-oh, crap. <laughs> I should have looked at that first. So, the zombie can't see me. It hasn't seen me yet. Standard zombie, not too tough. Uh, we have an open doorway here, and if I try to move to the door to close it, he'd be able to see me. Then he would come over and start banging on the door to get to me. We're at uh, plenty of or, uh, action points, though. We got a fire station guidebook. That's very useful. I would like to go to the nearest fire station, please. Let's see. I think I'm going to I'm going to try to keep moving, so I'm going to ignore his presence, go straight down to here. And I'm going to wait here. Cuz I don't know what's on the other side of the door. Yep, that's why I waited. All right, zombie. Standard zombie. Uh now I do have a stick. <laughs> I can actually use that uh that plank as a weapon. It's not a great weapon, but uh, it's better than dulling my knife on easy zombies. Can you do unarmed attacks? I don't remember. I think you have to pick something. I don't think you can just fisticuff zombies. So, damage 1 to 4 to 1.8, and we're still going to get our combat bonus. So if we apply it here, it's going to do 3.6 to 4.4. It's guaranteed to kill it. It's probably going to destroy the plank. Yeah. That's fine. I can get more planks. Hey, a couch. So notice the couch. Sleep quality plus 50%. So if we slept on the couch with our pillow, we would uh, sleep a lot faster. We'd recover our stats with a lot less time passing. Um, let's go ahead and go to there, grab the cloth, more clothing choices. 
So take them all. <laughs> Three different sweaters. All right, so durability low, condition 43. Low 45 and low 76. So let's use that one. And I'm going to drop that one and that one. Let's go ahead and put the windbreaker on too. Whoops. So I got to carefully gauge the timing because when the when nighttime hits, we're only going to be able to see the square we're in. We're not even going to be able to see the square next to us with our current night vision range. So I got six hours. If If nothing else, if I try to move to the library, for example... Uh, it's going to be this diagonal direction. I'd have to get to the library, secure it, and have a place to sleep. So it'd be out that path. It's going to take me at least... Ooh, I'd have to go out this window and then wrap around. Or go out past that zombie. Could be a zombie waiting for me out here as well. So I have to basically decide, do I want to stay here for the day and the night? Or do I want to try to push on to another, another area? I think I'm going to try to push on to this other house. Let's go this way. We'll see if we can get this secured for the day and the night, and then we'll push up to the library tomorrow. All right, now I don't know what's around the corner here, and I need to get my points maximized. Three points to get there. Do I take the risk? There's not a zombie waiting for me. I'm going to risk it. All right, no zombie waiting for me. Uh, what do we got? Scrap plastic, some sticks. I'm not going to worry about those. Now the problem is I'm going to have to wait twice, essentially, in order to get across this. I don't want to go with 11.7 action points. It's going to cost me 8 to get across. So let's, uh, let's do something that uses some time. For every 20 pages you read, you get location information of a nearby fire station. So I'm going to go ahead and read, 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 read. That's nearby, huh? <laughs> That's not nearby enough to be useful to me. Not in the near term. 